Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG Case of the Week for August 25th, 2014. This week's case, I think, is a relatively quick one. This was sent by Dr. Patrick Bruss, who works in Toledo, Ohio, and he's sent a handful of really nice cases over the past few years. Anyway, one day he was working, and a 21-year-old man was brought into the emergency department by EMS with a first-time seizure. Now, upon arrival, the patient was still somewhat postictal, and he had some real abnormalities on his vital signs. Although he was afebrile, he was very tachycardic, maybe a little bit hypertensive, but the key thing that stood out was his tachycardia of 160. Now, maybe that's not too unusual for a person that just had a seizure, but you'd expect that the heart rate would come down relatively quickly, and it really wasn't. His exam was otherwise unremarkable, post-dictal, very tachycardic, but nothing else jumping out on examination. And with the heart rate like that, you're probably going to get a 12 lead EKG pretty quickly. And also, as we've talked about before, hopefully by now, after going through a number of previous cases with a first-time seizure, you're also going to be looking at a quick early 12 lead EKG. Well, here's the 12 lead. Now, in the past, we've talked about the importance of checking a 12 lead in patients with the first time seizure looking for signs that maybe they had an arrhythmia. For example, maybe they've got signs of a prolonged QT and the arrhythmia was actually caused by torsade. In other words, not a true arrhythmia, but they had an arrhythmia that hyperperfused the brain and that caused a seizure that caused them to fall to the ground and shake a little bit. Maybe they had Brugada syndrome and that produced a run of polymorphic VTAC. Maybe they had, maybe they have evidence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on the 12 lead and so you can presume that the syncope or seizure was related to a brief episode of uh, ventricular arrhythmia or even V-fib, or maybe there are signs of WPW, and therefore the syncope slash seizure was related to a run of atrial fibrillation with WPW, and so on. Well, of course, there's other things that you're going to look for on the 12-lead ECG as well. And as you look at this, there's clear-cut very significant tachycardia. There are a number of deep, narrow Q waves in a bunch of leads, which hopefully is making some of you worry about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the voltage is it's relatively high. So high voltage with deep, narrow Qs uh, in a handful of leads ought to be making you think about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the one other thing that really should be jumping out at you right now, aside from the tachycardia, is that this patient has a very rightward axis. Now, most of the time, people don't pay a lot of attention to axis, right? Axis doesn't get a lot of respect on the 12 lead, but right axis deviation is really unusual. And so when you do see rightward axis deviation on the 12 lead EKG, there's a differential of things that are worth going through. You know, left axis deviation is a lot more common. There's a lot of relatively benign things that can produce left axis. And so we kind of inappropriately, I would say, but we have a tendency to not pay a lot of attention on the leftward axis. But when you see rightward axis, stop for a second and just think about the differential. Now, this is the internal medicine differential of rightward axis. Maybe there's a few other things that I'm missing, but these are things that you probably might, maybe you think of, certainly from the internal medicine standpoint, cardiology standpoint, these are things that you might be thinking of with the rightward axis, right ventricular hypertrophy, left posterior fascicular block dextrocardia. You don't see that too often. If a person's had a, a large previous lateral MI, they're going to have giant Q waves in lead one, and that's going to give you a rightward axis, right? Uh, Ventricular ectopy or VTAC can give you a rightward axis. Hyperkalemia can do anything to the 12 lead. Remember, it's the great imitator or the syphilis of electrocardiography. You can get new axis changes, new fascicular blocks, bundle branch blocks, and so on. Well, misplaced leads, sodium channel blocking drugs like tricyclics or any type one medication, and then acute pulmonary hypertension. RVH, this is chronic pulmonary hypertension, but acute pulmonary hypertension can produce a rightward axis as well. And in emergency medicine, the one major cause of acute pulmonary hypertension is 
pulmonary embolism. So that's the internal medicine differential of rightward axis. But you know what? A lot of these things are not acute in nature. A lot of these things may be not that relevant to emergency medicine because they're not acute. So let's get rid of some of the things from this list. And let's just talk about things that give you a relatively new rightward axis. We can take right ventricular hypertrophy, left posterior fascicular block, dextrocardia off the list. Hopefully you're going to get an old EKG and you'll see that those are old so we can get rid of those. But you know what? We can probably take some of these things off the list also. Lateral MI with big Q waves in lead one. Well, you're probably going to see signs of big Q waves in other lateral leads as well. And if you don't see that, you can cross that off the list. Well, VTAC can give you a rightward axis, but you're also going to see obvious signs of VTAC, a regular wide complex tachycardia. So let's take that off the list. Uh, hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia can produce a rightward axis, but you're probably going to see other signs of hyperkalemia, PT waves, widening, significant widening of the QRS, and so on. So you know, you know what? Let's take those off the list also. And that leaves us with these things. These are the three things that I recommend you think about whenever you see a rightward axis, especially a new rightward axis, and there's nothing else significant jumping out at you on the 12 lead EKG. There's no peak T waves or regular wide complex tachycardia and so on. When you see a new rightward axis and there's nothing else really notable on the 12 lead, think about misplaced leads Think about overdoses or toxicities from sodium channel blocking drugs and think about acute pulmonary hypertension, especially pulmonary embolism, okay? Now, with that said, let's go back to the original 12 lead EKG and I don't know that there's really anything else jumping out at you suggesting misplaced leads. Uh, AVL can go north or it can go south, so that's not terribly remarkable. One other thing that might be jumping out at you is a tall R wave in AVR, and some of you may know what that is suggestive of, all right? So misplaced leads, you know, the, the other thing that you look for, which would be indicative of misplaced leads, is if lead V6 and um, AVR are heading in, uh, in the same direction, AVR, you know, AVR appears to be going up and V6 appears to be going up. So that is somewhat suggestive of misplaced leads. So pearl number one, whenever you see V6 and AVR heading in the same direction, consider misplaced leads and repeat the 12 lead. Just repeat it, okay? Uh, it's no big hassle for anyone to repeat the 12 lead, but you want to make sure that you pick up misplaced leads. In this particular case, you repeat the 12 lead, you verify the leads, and it's not misplaced leads, right? So here we are with this differential misplaced leads. We can cross that off because we went ahead and we repeated the 12 lead EKG. And that leaves two possibilities for patients that are presenting with acute new rightward axis or acute problems and they have a rightward axis. Please think about sodium channel blocking drugs and acute pulmonary hypertension or PE. And in this particular scenario, the history helps give it away. Acute PE, well, this patient didn't present with acute shortness of breath, and PEs, as far as I know, don't present with new seizures. On the other hand, this does present with new seizure disorder. And again, if you go back to this 12 lead EKG, one of, what, one of the other things that we've all learned about a rightward axis in association with the tall R wave in AVR is that this can be very notable and predictive that your patient has a sodium channel blocker toxicity, tricyclic overdose, cocaine overdose, uh, and so on. So let's give this patient some bicarb because we're worried about the sodium channels and the patient gets a few boluses of bicarb and right off the bat you can see that the axis is improved and the tall R wave in AVR is now starting to normalize. And that also, by the way, verifies that the leads are properly placed because AVR is heading down and V6 is heading up and they should normally be heading in opposite directions. And then a couple of hours later, the patient's on a bicarb drip. And this EKG is a bit odd, but this is your lead one and this is your lead F. So you can see that the QRS, uh, the axis appears to be continuing to normalize now that the patient's on a bicarb drip. 
and this turned out to be a cocaine overdose. So the patient was very appropriately treated with bicarb. And of course, if you know that the patient's got cocaine on board, you're probably gonna give them high doses of benzodiazepines as well. So a quick, simple case, and I just wanted to focus on something that people don't normally pay a lot of attention to, and that is the axis, specifically rightward axis. So simple take home point, in emergency medicine, whenever you see a rightward axis, especially if you get an old EKG and you discover that this is new rightward axis, your three things in the differential are PE, sodium channel blocker toxicity, and there's a lot of meds that fit into that category, and lead misplacement. All you gotta do is repeat the 12 liter, verify the leads, and you can knock this out, and usually the history, the respiratory rate, uh, and um, any preceding seizures or anything else will d help you distinguish between PE versus the sodium channel blocker toxicity. Don't ignore the axis, and especially when you see a rightward axis, think PE, think sodium channel blocker toxicity. And that's especially a great pearl to keep in mind for the boards because both PE and sodium channel blocker toxicity are high risk for showing up on your board exam. All right, so quick, simple, easy case with a simple take home point. I hope that was helpful. And I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Bye for now.